So I wanted to start out going over our objectives. I wanted to talk a little bit about healthy eating um, as it applies to childhood nutrition and then into adulthood. So I know many of you might be parents and this may be of some interest. So it'll be pretty concise, but hopefully you'll get some decent information. And then based on a lot of your pre-registration questions, um, dysphagia came up a bit and I wanted to go over that. Over uh, Dysphagia means difficulty swallowing. And so we'll review the dysphagia diets and also um, feeding tube issues and questions. Um, and then the biggest I think interest that I saw through some of your questions were GI issues. And in our clinic we find that this is probably uh, the same and there's a lot of interest here and that's why um, we want to bring it up because it's treatable and we can do different things to help ease some of those complications. So healthy eating, why does it matter? Um, whether you have uh, myotonic dystrophy or not, we do see that there's a big um, epidemic, especially in the United States with metabolic syndrome or diabetes, heart disease, and we have seen in the literature that those with DM are at increased risk of insulin resistance, which I'll describe that a little bit in a minute, increased uh, leptin, which is a hormone that aids with fat storage, and insulin resistance and leptin, these will increase your risk for type 2 diabetes and heart disease. Um, I want to give a little bit of background on insulin and its role. Uh, insulin is a hormone and it's made by our pancreas. And I like to think of it as a taxi cab for sugar in your blood. When you eat a meal, your pancreas um, secretes in insulin into your blood. And as your meal gets digested and broken down into sugar, it's the taxi cab for sugar. It drives around, it picks up the sugar, and it's, its job is to take it to your body cells and drop them off and let your cells metabolize the sugar for energy. What happens with insulin resistance is your body cells don't see the insulin. They don't recognize it and so it just keeps driving around in your blood and the sugar is, is attached to it and it raises your blood sugar and if that is chronically happening over long periods of time it can cause damage to nerves and blood vessels and ultimately that is uh, type 2 diabetes. So um, really important and diet plays a significant role with that and helping to treat that and helping to prevent that. Um, same thing with heart disease. Briefly, what we'd want to do diet wise would be to carb control that carbohydrate. That's what that CHO means. Sorry, I probably should have typed that out. Um, spreading your carbohydrates throughout the day, eating, finding lean source of protein, and choosing healthy fats. Good thing with, uh, with healthy eating is the important thing is you need to start young. Um, a really big problem in our country right now. And these tips would go, would serve any family, whether you have a chronic disease or not. But you need to avoid high calorie vet beverages. And that is soda pop, obviously, but I would also go as far and include fruit juice, even 100% fruit juice. It has a lot of concentrated sugar in a small amount. You need to encourage whole, fat, uh, whole fruits and vegetables. And I know our kids can be picky. Um, I've got my own, but there's been a lot of research to show that the more you offer good foods, the more likely your kids will eat them later in life. So um, don't give up and keep offering these fruits and vegetables. As a parent, it's your job to bring healthy foods into the house. Lean sources of protein. I like to uh, think of this as, think of things that fly and swim. Those are going to be your heart healthier options. Chicken, fish, low fat dairy, um, turkey, great options. Um, I also think you could consider a basic multivitamin or a fish oil supplement. 
omega-3 fatty acids, great options. They're available liquid, gummy, chewable forms. There are some brand names listed on the slide there. And unless you've been given doctor recommendations to have a certain dose, you can use your, the dose on the label for that and do not exceed that dose unless otherwise um, told by your doctor. Uh, one of the, the, the issues that we see and complaints that we hear about in clinic is fatigue. Um, and I think scheduling your meals will help with this. Uh, be consistent, try not to skip meals, uh, but schedule them out and uh, in, enjoy enjoy lunchtime, breakfast time. It should not be something that you don't like to do. So uh, limit the sugar that you have. Uh, sugar is, and I'm referring to added sugar, refined sugar, cakes, donuts. Fruit is okay. Uh, I don't want to confuse with that, but it's the added sugar that can, you know, cause that insulin to be released and uh, the sugar to go up and eventually that can cause a crash and that can lead to fatigue. So limit that amount of added sugar that you have in your diet. Non-starchy vegetables at every meal. So non-starchy, that means um, watery vegetables like cucumbers, tomatoes, carrots, salads, lettuces. Things like that are going to be good options. The starchy vegetables like potatoes, corn, peas, they, those have a heavy carbohydrate load and will have um, a high sugar response in your blood. Spread your carbohydrates evenly throughout the day and you've got a list there of which foods have carbs in them. And uh, a good way to help control the spike in your blood sugar is to also add lean protein at each meal. And I would even also suggest, I didn't put that on there, but uh, a moderate amount of fat would also be a good idea to help um, help that glycemic load. Chicken fish, eggs, beans, low fat dairy are great low protein options, lean protein options. And so I will move on to dysphagia. Dysphagia is a big word for uh, difficulty eating and uh, we, a lot of our patients have, have this. So uh, one of the questions that came up uh, in the pre-registration was how often should one be evaluated? Well, evaluation is done by a speech pathologist or therapist usually. And in our clinic, unless you have problems, there's no regular uh, protocol for how often you receive a, a swallow eval. Uh, so you need to be proactive, and if you notice a problem, you need to tell your provider, and they can refer you to a speech pathologist. So follow doc re doctor recommendations. I want to refer you to a previous webinar by Michael Gruer. If you go back to the archives, you'll find it. He goes into great detail on dysphagia and its diagnosis, the muscles involved, and testing. I'm going to focus a little bit more on the diet part of that, but just concisely, one of those, uh, the main evaluation is a modified barium swallow, and this is when you uh, eat food or take a liquid. It's mixed with barium, and your swallow is observed under x-ray, and then they come through that x-ray, they're going to see if um, where you're having problems exactly in the eating process and if you're aspirating, aspirating is when you get food, saliva, mucus into your lungs instead of into uh, the esophagus and it goes around the wrong tube. So that's briefly the diagnosis of dysphagia and how and when you should do that. There are three different levels in uh, a dysphagia diet, diet and there are different organizations have different um, names for these, but they're pretty much synonymous and the same thing. But dysphagia level one is pureed foods, pretty straightforward. Um, pureed foods, they need to be blended up. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, dysphagia two, those are going to be mechanically altered. Dysphagia three, advanced. And 
defend, depending on your individual needs, you may or may not need to thicken your liquids. So that is, may or may not be something you need. So pureed foods. Uh, this means it needs to be blended, whipped, mashed, a pudding-like texture, no clumps. And this is a very small list in front of you, but um, oatmeal is not allowed. There's still too clumpy. But if it's slurried, basically if you can put it in a blender, it's going to be fine. Um, juice needs to be without pulp, and depending on if you need thickened liquids, you might need to adjust that texture. Meats, pureed, beans, everything just needs to be put through a blender. All right, mechanically altered. This is, again, by blending, grinding, chopping, or mashing. Now you're allowed to have oatmeal. It's a little bit less restrictive. Cooked cereals, soft pancakes, fruits and vegetables that are seedless and skinless and canned are all okay. But if it had seeds, if it's a tough fruit like pineapple, it's not recommended. Meats. Uh, moist casseroles are good, ground meats and poultries, but things that are not recommended, pizza, cube cheese, peanut butter, those can be more difficult to swallow. All right, advanced. This is the least restrictive. And hot cereals, really like soaked, soggy, dry cereal is okay. Um, pastas, casseroles are all okay. Bagels and dry bread are not recommended. Grilled cheese sandwiches also not necessarily um, compliant on this list. Fruits and vegetables should be cooked, skinless, and small seeds would be all right, but um, you want to stay away from big things. The berries are, are okay. You want to still avoid grapes, raisins, um, cooked broccoli. Broccoli can really... Um, spread and spray in your mouth and is not recommended. Same thing with nuts and seeds in the meat section. Not recommended, but cheese and eggs are all right. Move on to thickened liquids. This will be based on your speech therapist or pathologist recommendations. In the pharmacies, most over-the-counter pharmacies have a thickener available. They can come in gel or powder form, and you can add them to soups, water, um, beverages, whatever you you want. There are some brand names on your list. There are also a lot of generic ones out there. You can also try uh, juices and liquids that are naturally thick, like the Ottawa or Naked Juices, um, V8, and Kern's Nectar juices are some good options that you can try. Thin liquids are, can be troublesome because they move around so quickly in your mouth and you have little control. When you thicken them up, then you have a little bit more time and you can think about your swallow a little bit. So that's why thickened liquids tend to be better. Sometimes using a straw is also helpful. Okay, so why eating might not get you everything that you need. Uh, we just got done talking about dysphagia, so that's a big problem. Eating could also be very time-consuming and fatiguing. Maybe you have difficulty feeding yourself or hand grip weakness, and maybe you don't like eating in front of others. These are all problems or kind of cues to you where you might want to consider some alternative form of nutrition. So a precutaneous gastrostomy tube is a feeding tube that is in your stomach. It's long-term access. And it's not very common in the DM population, but we do see it. And I, and I want, I, I feel it's my job to, to help educate and make people aware. There's a lot of, feeding tubes are given a bad rap and I wanna just help clarify and educate. So um, because it's long-term access, it's going to be through your stomach and you can kind of see here on the the diagram that you've got no tubes coming out of your nose or mouth so you've got a tube coming out of your stomach and down there on the bottom you can see you've got two different options you've got the standard tube there on the left and a, a low profile or Mickey tube on the right and 
uh, kind of depends on what you like. And usually you have to have a standard tube placed at the beginning. I'll go into more detail, but um, I want you to know that when you have a feeding tube, for the most part, as long as you're safely able to eat, we want you to. We want you to still enjoy food. And um, so I don't want you to think that, oh no, if I get a feeding tube, I'll never be able to eat again. That's not the case. So when is it time? Well, you, you need to be proactive in your care and you need to let your doctor know symptoms that you're ha having. Um, we'll discuss some of those and keep an open mind and follow your doctor recommendations. It's always going to be your choice. The last thing we want is for you to not have your autonomy, but um, keep your mind open and listen and get educated because most of our patients wish they would have gotten it and, and you know it's not as bad as one might think. So why, when is it time? So maybe you're losing weight and you're not able to uh, meet your, your needs orally. You're losing weight, you might be fatigued, possibly you're getting dehydrated. You've had a swallow eval and it's been, um, it's shown that you've had aspiration risks. Maybe you're choking with your meals, you're coughing a lot on saliva or with your meals, you're pocketing food. What I mean by that is food gets stuck in between your your teeth and your cheek um, because your mouth muscles aren't um, able to and tongue aren't able to move food around as well and maybe you're not recognizing it but you're subconsciously avoiding certain foods and you're staying away from meat so you don't eat salad anymore yet you used to love it um, those are all just different signs for you to look at and think about that maybe it's time and you know talk to your doctor about concerns and to get accurate information so here you have a link if you're at all you know worried about the feeding tube the peg placement procedure you can click on that and see it I just wanted to go over the pros and cons of the actual procedure and having a feeding tube um, the pros are, this is quite common and uh, well-tolerated procedure. It's outpatient, doesn't take that long. The actual procedures may be 20 minutes. Obviously, they're going to have some nutritional benefits when you're not, and social benefits, when you're not spending half of your day trying to eat or the anxiety around eating can be um, ameliorated by getting the feeding tube. And you can still eat as long as you're, um, been cleared to do so. Some cons of the procedure is it is slightly invasive. No surgery is without risk, so um, there you may be sedated and that may pose some respiratory risks, something to talk to your doctor about. And post-procedure complications might be possibility of infection, wound pain, toleration to feeding the formula, or clogging of the tube. So what are these these feedings that I'm talking about? Um, there are a couple companies in the United States that uh, make fan manufactured formulas and we like these and we recommend them. Uh, the nutrient values are easy to calculate, they reduce your risk of clogs and they're well tolerated. But if you want we've got uh, a lot of patients that we treat make their own formulas and that's also an option, but you do increase your risk of clogging your tube. And you may not be getting your nutrients, but if you do your research and get good for uh, good recipes, then it is uh, an option for you. Home health companies provide you with the formula and education. A lot of these companies, not only do they have nurses, but they do have dietitians on staff to help you with questions that you might have. A lot of different options, a lot of different formulas out there. If you're diabetic, there are diabetic formulas. If you have trouble absorbing things, there are uh, semi-elemental formulas. A lot of different options, with fiber, without fiber. Those are available. And you can get feedings in three different ways. 
a bolus feeding is when you get a large volume in a small amount of time. And I like to compare that to eating a meal. Depending on what your prescription is, you might have, um, you know, four cans of formula a day, or you have two cans in for breakfast, one can for lunch, one can for dinner. Maybe you're eating a little bit. Uh, and they don't, it doesn't take very long, 10 to 20 minutes. Sometimes uh, volume is too large, and we can go to our next step would be a gravity feeding. This is a little bit more, it's not very portable because you have an IV pole with a bag filled with formula, but it has a controlled drip where you're not getting that huge volume all at once. It's going in in a 20 to 30 minute time period. Um, and then the next step is a pump, which is actually uh, quite portable. They have these backpacks where you can, you know, carry them around with you. A lot of young kids, you can see them playing on playgrounds with, with a pump on their back, and they're getting their little feeds. So uh, different ways and different ways, yeah, to get your your nutrition through a um, a peg. The biggest, um, many of you had a lot of questions on GI health and gut health, and I wanted to uh, go over that. Um, biggest, a lot of complaints in our clinic, and these issues can be quite debilitating, and there are different things that we can do. Um, so, GI issues can occur at any level of your gastrointestinal tract, from your mouth and, and um, swallowing pharyngeal uh, portions to your large gut, your large bowel. And the common complaints are reflux, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, distension, diarrhea, bowel incontinence, constipation. Like I said, these can be quite debilitating and um, sometimes it's the GI issues that um, first manifest with uh, myotonic dystrophy. Some treatments may include, uh, I'm going to go over a couple of medications, but obviously I'm going to focus on the diet portion. Prokinetics, like uh, metoclopramide, which is Reglan, that can help improve uh, gastric emptying and treat nausea, bloating, constipation, abdominal pain. Um, Erythromycin is also a prokinetic, and at the same time, it's an antibiotic, and it can help treat bacterial overgrowth, which I think is the cause of a lot of the diarrhea that we see. Um, cholestyramine is also another medication. If you happen to have, if you're not absorbing bile acid, that can cause diarrhea, and cholestyramine can can bind to the bile acid and kind of inactivate it, so it's not giving you that diarrhea. Mixilatine is also common in our clinic. It can help with some swallowing issues. We've also, um, I w was watching the, um, the webinar from John Day, or hit the video of his, and he mentioned that it might help with esophageal cramping, and I know some of you had questions on that. So try, ask your doctor about mixilatine if you're having some cramping, in, esophageal cramping. Um, we also see some good benefits for diarrhea, treating diarrhea with mixilatine. If you've got constipation, there are laxative and enemas. But of course, I want to focus on the diet portion of this. This little slide kind of gives you, I, I liked the picture, so I thought I would add it. Um, kind of tells you why diarrhea is such a problem. when. Your gut's not moving, which is common with my, myotonic dystrophy. Um, you've got this reduced peristalsis activity. Peristalsis is the intestine contracting, and as it contracts, it moves food through your in, through your gut. Um, but if that's not working, then your bowels get all sludgy and things aren't moving along, and it gives bacteria a chance to to grow. 
and the bacteria can ferment and it can cause, you know, not only the diarrhea, but it can uh, create some bloating and gas issues, um, cause the malabsorption of bile acid, which can cause the diarrhea. So a lot of different um, different problems can be associated with this bacterial overgrowth. And that's why trying a prokinetic to get your bowel moving, get that peristalsis going is, is helpful. But fiber. Uh, we like fiber in our clinic. Um, I want to bring up, if you are planning on starting a high fiber diet, you need to increase the amount that you eat slowly, and you need to drink plenty of fluid. Aim for at least eight cups of water a day. If you're not gonna, if you don't want to drink more fluid, then a high fiber diet is not for you. Focus on soluble fiber if you've got diarrhea that um, seems to be helpful. And insoluble fiber is a good option for preventing constipation. And finding the two different fibers is it's not that big of a deal. I'll have a list of soluble fiber things, but a lot of the high fiber foods that you think of have a little bit of both. And so you just, if you focus on getting fiber, you're probably getting the appropriate amount of soluble and insoluble. They both have good health benefits. So what to aim for? Uh, like I said, don't go too quickly, too much at one time if your body's not used to it will also cause GI symptoms. Um, as adults, you should have anywhere from 25 to 38 grams of fiber daily. Children, I mean, one to three, you know, should aim for 19. So these are high levels, and a lot of us are not getting them. Dietary fiber is, is on the nutrition label, and it can be helpful helpful resource to you. Um, uh, to speak to your doctor or dietitian before starting a high fiber diet might not be for everybody. So little disclaimer there. Uh, here are some good food sources of soluble fiber. Uh, when you look at that chart, it says total fiber, and that is total, including insoluble and soluble, but these are good options. Uh, the psyllium supplement at the bottom, uh, Metamucil is a psyllium su supplement, so you can try that. Oatmeal is great, apples, pears, uh, a lot of fruits and vegetables, they're going to contain both insoluble too, so you get both. Um, banana is also great for diarrhea. It has pectin in it. I, uh, pectin is often used in the hospital to treat diarrhea, so uh, not banana flakes because of the, the pectin that is in the banana flakes. Don't go out and buy pectin in your jam making section of your grocery store. I don't think that that will, uh, might help a little bit, but don't use that. Go get banana flakes if you want to. Um, okay, fluid. Drink plenty of fluid. If you don't want to drink more fluid and you want to eat a high-fiber diet, that's not recommended. You're going to make your symptoms worse. If you do, the two go together. And I recommend water as your fluid source. So... There's no real reason for us to be drinking Gatorade or the sports drinks uh, unless you need the extra electrolytes. There's too much sugar in those things. So How about water. water. I great. just thought I'd, I'd start off with the first question. <laughs> yeah, coconut. That's great. Well, thank you, Kari. You ready? Everybody uh, ready for questions? I'll hear people cheering. Yeah, I. Kind of looking at the pre-questions that I have here. Um, one person asked about swallowing, if it can affect one side of your throat. Yes, it can. Um, go to that dysphagia seminar by Michael Grewer. He goes into more detail on that. Um, muscle cramps when you swallow, trimaxillotine. Think research trials available. Um, I don't know of any nutrition-related research trials, and I think that's probably a good thing to be researched. I think that there's a lot of interest. Um, well, I have some questions that people have uh, written in during your presentation. Sure. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, 
which are the foods with the highest nutritional values that the DM community should be consuming? Well, I think um, kale is probably one of the best things you can have. Um, but if you have trouble swallowing lettuce -y type things, the you might want to stay away about that. But greens in general, collard greens, kale, spinach are fabulous things to include in your diet. And I also think um, avocados are great. They have a wonderful um, fat profile as well as salmon. So. And you know, um, an easy way to eat kale is to put it in a yeah. blender with avocado and a few other greens and water, and you can make an incredible green soup and a little salt, and it's it's really good. Yeah. That's how I get my kale. Yeah. Okay. Using mixilatine helps me. Do any foods help the mixilatine? Uh, not that I know of. You can talk to a pharmacist about that if there are any like interactions that may inhibit. I haven't heard of any. And what to help it, I don't know. Sorry. Okay. I don't. Here's another question. Um, how do we help with leptin fat storage? Well, leptin is, so it's a, a fat hormone. And leptin actually does a good thing in in that it helps us um, feel satiated. Um, but a lot of times people who are overweight still have, who have high leptin value, values are still not listening to the cues to stop eating. Um, I, you need to, you know, my guess would be you look at your your calorie balance and your how much you're eating. The more you eat, the more calories you have, the more leptin is going to be released into your blood. And the more that that's telling your body to convert all of that extra calories into and store it as fat. So you've got to control your intake is my answer to that. Okay. Um... Here's a, the next question. Can poor swallowing yield to increased hiccuping following meals? I don't know about that. I, I mean, I think that would make sense. You get extra air in your, your stomach, but yeah, I can't really answer that. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, some, of the, some people, uh, there was a question about um, burping uh, also. I don't know if I sent that to you. That's oh, no, I didn't get that one. Have you heard that, that there's more belching in the DM community than the, you know, average population? I wouldn't be surprised with the respiratory issues involved and in, you might be getting air into the, the stomach easier. I don't know, but it's not necessarily a, too common of a complaint. Or the bacterial overgrowth um, might be getting... I don't know, you're getting bloated and distended and it's just moving its way up instead of down. Well, that's a good transition to this next question. Um, I tend to bloat after I eat. What can I do to help this? And and I just wanted to offer the idea, and, and Kari, please you know, tell everyone how you feel about drinking uh, water, a lot of water or fluids during a meal. Doesn't that tend to bloat you as well? Right. Well, we uh, when we hear about bloating, what I would suggest is um, small, frequent meals, and um, the the more you eat in a short amount of time, the more bloated you're going to feel. And if if you try and look at this as a volume issue, then by doing small, frequent meals, it will be be useful. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, getting things moving, you know, get fiber in your diet, get things moving and get your, your stomach and your bowels processing the food and getting it out of you um, instead of being sluggish 
and sitting in your gut will will be helpful. So um, drinking throughout the day in between meals and small frequent meals and fiber. Get get the, the bowels moving so it's not slow and sluggish. Mm-hmm. Okay, now I don't know if this is a joke question, but we can always use a little levity. Where can you get kale? <laughs> ah, yes, your grocery store. You can get kale in your produce section. Um, uh, I'm, you know, I'm not too crazy about going organic versus non-organic, but I think if you um, were to choose organic in your lettuces and your greens, like kale and spinach, that would be a good option to choose organic versus um, inorganic when it comes to your greens. But you're going to find it in the produce section. You can also find it um, frozen um, in the vegetable section, in the frozen aisle. I think that question came from a meat and potatoes man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here, the next one. I've been diagnosed with a slow, emptying stomach. Fiber seems to make it worse. Is that condition part of DM? Um, the the gastric de- emptying definitely. Yeah, and there, you know, talk to your doctor about a prokinetic like Reglan or erythromycin. Okay. The fiber's not working for you. Do people with DM sometimes have absorption issues? Low protein, low vitamin D, low iron. Um, I wouldn't say that that is necessarily. Um, what you're describing sounds like a lot of the rest of the population. Vitamin D deficiencies are very common, mm. um, depending on where you live. Um, I think here in Utah, it's like 50% of us are uh, vitamin D deficient uh, based on the latitude of where we are. But um, iron is not uncommon, and uh, protein is just, I really think that it would be based on your diet. So I'm not. I I don't think if that is certainly specific. I don't think it's that specific to the DM population, as to maybe other reasons why you might be deficient in iron, vitamin D, and protein. So, switching gears, um, the question is: Well, there are two questions. Large stools? Question mark. And does a probiotic help? So I don't know. There okay. Well, large stools. I don't think that having large stools is a bad thing. I think that means you're probably eating pretty well, unless um, it is hurting you when you go to the bathroom, or if they're hard stools. What was that second question? Does a probiotic help? Uh, probiotic helps with getting healthy bacteria in your bowels and getting things going. I don't know if they want to know if it's going to give you large stools or if it will lessen it, but <laughs> um, probiotics are not a bad option to try. And you can find it, you can find them individually in powder form or pill form in the refrigerated section of a health food store, or you can find probiotics in yogurt, cultured yogurt and kefir in the regular grocery store. Oh, actually, I did receive an email uh, from someone just about an hour ago asking if the Activa challenge would help. I think sure, that's, give it a shot. Yeah. That's a yogurt that has probiotics in it? Yep, yep. They have more Dan Active, Activia. They have um, more strains than other yogurts, more strains of probiotics. Okay. Um, so this next question, how do you make the kale and avocado soup? Um, <laughs> I actually uh, had that at a festival recently, and it was called uh, alkalinizing green soup. So, um, and I can, I, the person I know who asked this, and I could send you a link to it, but I was wondering, Kari, if you have anything to say about, you know, alkaline al- alkaline foods versus... Um, Acidic foods? Yeah. Oh, 
you know, in my opinion, the you know we we get questions about about this a lot, and when you look about the the foods that help that are high alkaline foods, they tend to be fruits and vegetables and things that you should be eating anyways. So I'm all on board, sure. Okay, it was, it's, it was the soup I had, and it's really, it's more like a, a, a smoothie, was like the healthiest thing I've ever had in my life. And that doesn't mean that it tasted like a vitamin. It was pretty good. But I will um, send you that link person that asked that question. Okay, I need caffeine to get through the day. Uh, what would you suggest to use to get it? So I guess what are your thoughts about caffeine? Well, so somebody had a question on um, nutrition related to heart ventricular arrhythmia, and maybe this is the same person who asked that. Um, caffeine, alcohol, maybe diet cleanses or herbal remedies they could induce arrhythmias, and so um, I, I just think, I don't think, you know, I love chocolate, and I know people like their coffee, and I'm, I'm fine with that. I think you just need to use moderation and common sense, and I'm fine with people eating, but if it makes your heart race, then stay away from it. Mm-hmm. What about taking a digestive enzyme? Um, yeah. I mean, if, you know, you can go to a GI doctor and get tested for, you know, some of these issues that we talked about. Maybe if, you, if you've got bacterial overgrowth or if your body's not producing enzymes. Um, I think if, and normally like our pancreas, it helps make, it makes insulin, but it also makes a lot of our digestive enzymes. And if you're diabetic, maybe you've got some problems with your pancreas and you're not producing the enzymes as well. But you'd have to talk to a GI doctor. Mm -hmm. But I don't see a problem. I don't think it would hurt you. So I'm looking at the original questions and it looks like... If there's yeah. one here for a FODMAP diet... Um, I think I'll. You want to explain what that is? Yeah. So, um, a, fo a FODMAP diet, those are, these are foods that are fermentable, oglio, di, mono, saccharide foods. And these, these foods are what they, they, um, oftentimes may not be very well digested and they can be fermented, which means bacteria breaks them down and can create gas and maybe distension, bloating, abdominal pain. And so this is a fairly recent diet in the realms of GI health, and a lot of people with IBS have found it beneficial. And I think it's a great thing to try. What it is, it's very restrictive. You're limiting yourself to... Um, so no gluten is allowed, um, very few fruits and vegetables are allowed, dairy is out, at, is out, beans are out, so you've got meat, pretty much, and you usually follow this diet for about six weeks, and then slowly introduce new foods, and you, you figure out what your trigger food is, is kind of the idea behind it. It's worth a shot if everything else isn't working, the the medications or the fiber, if it doesn't seem to help, um, you can try this FODMAP diet. Um, you mentioned fermented foods and I just wanted to ask uh, about kombucha because I've heard that um, it's very helpful with GI sluggishness. Do you have anything to say about that? What, what was that? Kanglucha? Oh, yeah, it's the, um, it's a fermented drink that originates from tea, I think black tea. Hmm, I have not heard about it. I'd have to look oh, into it. okay. Yeah. So. <laughs> That's a new one to me. It might be a very West Coast sort of uh, uh, <laughs> movement or fad. Um, would you, could you talk a little about 
how uh, someone would work with you as a registered dietitian and maybe the differences uh, between an RD and a nutritionist? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so I uh, got my education in dietetics. So I went to college for that and I did an internship. Um, and there is a new registration recently out there. They're CNs, they're clinical nutritionists. And they've re also received education and I think are just as valid. But um, other than that, than those people who have gone to school for it, pretty much anybody can call themselves a nutritionist. And so I would, you know, be careful and you know, I don't know, but there are a lot of fad diets out there and I don't want you, and it's confusing, it's confusing for those of us who are in it and we see conflicting data and yet, you know, you go on TV and you see all the different diets that are out there and it can be very confusing and just uh, go to the right person, make sure that this is what they've gone to college for and it's not just some two week crash test course that they got online and and I would also you know if they are pushing supplements on you that would probably be something you would want to stay away from and you also work at a neuromuscular clinic absolutely right I work in a neuromuscular facility with dealing with um, patients who have swallowing neuromuscular disorders and um, muscular dystrophy. So, uh, but I think a lot of dietitians are, are good out there and could be very useful. And so there's one final question. Oh, wait, let's see. There are two final questions. Okay. And this one is very specific. Um, I was on cholestramine for two years, and my new neurologist informed me that it stopped some other medications from being absorbed, like calcium, nexium, and some of my heart medications. Um, there's no real question there. I'm sorry. Right. Well, cholestyramine, yeah, I mean, there's side effects to it. So, um Calcium, I think you you know if you're smart about that, you spread out your dose and separate it out. It might, you know, you could improve the absorption on that. As far as your heart meds, I can't speak to that. Okay, so one final question, and I'd like to remind everyone that this webinar has been recorded. It will be on the MDF website within the next week. So if you tuned in late or want to review some of the slides you can do that. Okay, so the final question, how do you recommend to lose weight when leading, when one has a sedentary life? Well, you know, I I think, you know, if you, probably they've gone over this at different conferences on exercise, but I think you can do a lot of movement when you're sitting in a chair and it's, those are some exercises, things to, to get your body moving, but weight loss is 90% diet. So, um, you know, being sedentary, um, as much as that could be an excuse, it, there's diet plays a huge role. And so, eating well, um, there are apps that you can get if you've got a smartphone or a computer. You can, my fitness pal is a great one where you can, uh, you know, write down, keep a food log of everything that you're eating and you can see that you're probably eating more than you uh, think. Self-reporting is often very uh, under-reported and um, keeping track of the things you eat, weighing yourself once a week, those are good self-monitoring tips to help you stay on track and get going in the right direction. And also pay attention to what you're drinking. That's what we see. That's a huge, huge thing in our clinic. A lot of people are drinking a lot of soda pop and juice, and it plays a big role. Well, thank you. Those are good closing words because uh, I know um, people in my support groups over the years have um, 
drink a lot of sugared beverages and, and um, maybe they'll listen to this. <laughs> I know it's hard. I know it's hard, but, you know, it's your health. Take control of it. Well, thank you so much, Kari. I really appreciate your presentation. And I want to let everyone know that uh, MDF has a little um, book of recipes or booklet of recipes, and Kari provided some uh, nutritional evaluation for the recipes. And it's on our website here, this uh, web address, and you could download a copy of it. And, you know, if you print it and have a printer or a color printer, maybe it will look as bright as this. I was going to say, those heirloom tomatoes look pretty delicious. Yeah, I've seen them. They're here in California. We'll, we'll send you some in Utah. <laughs> yeah, please, please. Bye, Kari. Thank you. Bye.